All right, our native son here. Uh, and in fact, I think this is the image I use on the uh, on the welcome screen for Blackboard when you log into the class here. It's the Willits house that we'll show you in a moment. So I'm sure you're all familiar with Write at, at the very least. Um, and some of this may be, you know, a little bit of a um, recovering for you, but um, a regurgitation a little bit. But um, we'll get it all on the same page and really try to put him in context. If the theme of the first half of the semester was Palladio. We talked about Palladio almost every lecture, right? <laughs> and remember the old, you know, the, the sort of half-joking rule on the quizzes and exam. If, you just, if you're not sure, might as well answer Palladio. Well, Frank Lloyd Wright is going to be the theme here of the second half. Um, his, um, we're going to talk about him over the course of several lectures, and his his influence on architects throughout the 20th century, even into the 21st century, frankly, um, is still with us. I mean, it's it's profound, and he um, he cannot be overstated. He is absolutely probably the most important American architect, um, and uh, probably the most significant architect of the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, and partly because he had such a long career, you know. You think most most architects probably have a career highlight, you know, maybe a couple of decades. Um, he he his career starts in the 1890s and he dies in 1959 and he's still doing some of his best work when he dies uh, in the 1950s. That's a 60 year career uh, that um, you know was you know he had his ups and downs. Uh, most people wrote him off in the by the 1920s. Um, as we'll see, uh, they were premature in his obituary, his career obituary. So, um, like I say, we're really going to talk about him. But we're going to start with the prairie school or the prairie style. Um, they're kind of interchangeable terms. The, you know, we talked about the Chicago school. We're talking about the prairie school. And what I mean by that, it wasn't a school. It wasn't, you didn't go like you are. You know, you didn't go to and sign up for courses and that sort of thing. What it is is it, it's more than a style. A style is something that you replicate. Um, the idea of a school is that uh, the different architects working in a genre were influenced by each other and doing similar things, but coming about it with different conclusions. And this is important because when you're going to do your research on the Prairie School, other Prairie School architects, part of your mission is going to be to compare or contrast how your architect was interpreting the Prairie style in their own way that might be unique or it might be similar to what Frank Lloyd Wright was doing. Um, and so not all of these characteristics would apply to all of the architects. Um, and, and that's why we call it more of a school. It's a, it's, a, it's a train of thought rather than a specific set of guidelines that you have to follow. That's what a style is. Um, but a school is more of a philosophical approach. Uh, so the, the arts and crafts movement was a school. It was a movement, uh, a philosophical approach to architecture. And same, the prairie uh, is part of that broader movement, and it's a philosophical approach. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. But there are still some fairly typical, char typical characteristics, especially when we talk about Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, when he matures uh, the prairie style by, by 1900. And that typically will be a low-pitched roof. Uh, with ho deep overhanging eaves, an emphasis on horizontality and horizontal lines, something that will hug the flat Midwestern prairie. Uh, but there would generally be a central massive chimney. Um, this is in contrast to the multiple chimneys we were seeing with the English arts and crafts, which were much more direct inspired by medieval architecture. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was not inspired by medieval architecture. We'll see what architectural style influenced him in a moment. Uh, so he didn't want lots of little chimneys. He wanted a central massive chimney. Uh, an open plan, and this is an innovation that uh, really is credited uh, mostly to Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, we take it for granted now. You know, everybody, you know, gathers in the great room. You know, the kitchen and the family room is like one big giant room, right? And, you know, um, that didn't exist prior to Wright. Um, rooms were 
were four walls with small doorways that connected them. Parlors, Victorian parlors, um, uh, were, were common and typical. And you usually moved between often by hallways. Uh, and Wright said hallways are a waste um, of space. Now, you don't do anything in them. Um, so let's connect. Let's let the rooms flow between each other. And let's break down the, the walls, literally break down the walls between rooms and open them up. Uh, and we'll define space through other means. And I'll show you how he does that in a moment. Also, uh, rows of small windows um, or bands of windows that he would group together to create a one giant wide uh, glass wall, typically. And often these projections, this is something he does um, carry on from the English arts and crafts. His, his plans sort of spread out across the landscape. Um, like I say, this is pretty radical innovation uh, compared to um, houses that we have seen and talked about previously, certainly in the 19th century, this Victorian era. And the Prairie style gets named, um, it, it comes from a 1901 journal, Ladies Home Journal, that he published in, and he called it a home in a prairie town. And uh, later, another architect, Thomas Talmadge, actually, one of you will study him, uh, kind of took that and said, well, a home in a prairie town, prairie, let's call it prairie architecture. Uh, and so the prairie style or prairie school comes from uh, that. All right, so we're going to start actually with a non-prairie style house. We'll start with his home and studio. I'm only going to talk about it briefly because we'll talk more on our walking tour. He starts it in 1889. He buys this lot in Oak Park. Um, he actually borrows money from his boss, Louis Sullivan at the time, right, worked for Sullivan. Uh, Adler and Sullivan, and was working on the um, the auditorium building, which we talked about um, in our Chicago School lecture. He was he cut his teeth on that project, and was you know immediately Sullivan saw him as this immensely talented designer in his office, and gave him a bunch of promotions, and even said, "Oh, you need money to buy a house or bu build your house? Okay, I'll get I'll loan you money." Um, that later came back to bite both of them because Wright uh, started doing work on the side to get even more money to expand the house and instead of paying back the loan that he had gotten from Sullivan. And so he ultimately got fired from the office when Sullivan found out what he was doing. Uh, he would live here until 1909 and it, it was his laboratory. He would expand it, uh, like I said, <laughs> you know, using uh, bootleg houses uh, designs to, to pay for these additions. Um, and ultimately, when he did go out on his own, uh, he built his own studio here where, uh, where the Prairie style of architecture was, was created. So here is the house. Um, has everyone visited the house? I mean, give a give a little, you know, click your hands up button if you've uh, if you've actually been on a tour of the home and studio. Yes. Yes. A few times. I'm hearing a lot of yeses or a couple hands ups. If you have not, you got to put this on your list. Um, uh, I think they're even starting to give tours again now that the pandemic is is starting to end. Um, definitely go through this. This is this is an important house to visit and it's in your backyard practically. Um, so this is a photo I took. I love it in spring when the flowers are blooming in the yard um, because Wright loved nature. He wanted to connect his homes with the natural landscape around it and um, so it's always beautiful to see these houses you know, in a natural setting like this. Um, this is not Prairie School because it doesn't have most of the characteristics that I just talked about. It has a really steeped gabled roof, not a low pitched hipped roof. It doesn't have deep overhanging eaves. Uh, this is a band of windows right here. This is a little bit of what I was talking about and he put that in. Um, so he's, uh, what's neat about going through the house is it's, it's his laboratory, right? In 1889, he, he has not, even thought of something that would be known as the prairie style. But by 1900, um, the prairie style is in full bloom. Uh, certainly by the time he leaves in 1909, it's a full scale prairie style. And so all of that is created here. And as he's doing additions, he's experimenting, you know, better to experiment on your own family than on a paying client. And so a lot of the innovations that he would later incorporate into the prairie style excuse me, into the prairie style 
uh, were put into his house sometimes for the first time. Uh, yes, uh, Joman, the, sometimes these are called ribbon windows as well because they're just this long ribbon of, of glass. Notice though here he's using diamond pane windows, which is another nod to medieval, you know, that medieval romanticization or influence of the arts and crafts movement. So he's got a little bit of that influence going on here in the early days, but he would later knock off, um, he would knock off that direct medieval influence. One of the great spaces, um, we won't be taking a tour of the house itself on our walking tour, we'll just be outside. So I want to show you the playroom. Uh, this is one of the most incredible spaces in the Holman studio. Uh, it's got this wonderful barrel vault um, that we see. Um, uh, this is influenced from Louis Sullivan, which who was influenced by H.H. H. Richardson, that Roman arch that we saw at, at entrances to some of uh, Richardson's buildings later in Sullivan's work and when he builds this he's still highly influenced by his time working with Louis Sullivan so we see this belted space uh, really in fantastic mural down on the end by Orlando Giannini and we see art glass windows in here uh, he adds the playroom um, I think right around 19, uh, 1895 or so. So he's already starting to incorporate elements of the Prairie School in this room. There's Roman brick. Roman brick is the long horizontal brick, not the more rectangular brick that we're used to. And he uses Roman brick because it has a horizontality to it. So right here in the playroom, we're already starting to see elements of the Prairie School that he would later, you know, incorporate into is um, with his paying clients. Here is a view of the exterior of the studio. So he adds the studio in 1889, or excuse me, in 19, um, 19, 1898. Um, I should have put the right date on there. Uh, so in 1898, he adds the studio. He's lost his job with Sullivan. For a few years, he just rented office space downtown. Uh, but as his practice became more successful, he built the studio and um, all the architects and designers that he hired worked out of the studio here in Oak Park. And so it has a separate entrance off Chicago Avenue. That's right here. Uh, this, the big box with the octagon on top, that's the studio space. And on the right is the library. I'll show you the plan in a minute. Uh, notice the heavy geometries that he's using here. We even saw that in his house. Um, right for his entire career was obsessed with geometry. He got that from uh, what were called Froibel blocks. These were little, you know, little architectural building blocks that his mom gave him when he was a child. You know, like you would have had building blocks, Legos and things like that as a kid. Um, these were rudimentary uh, wood uh, blocks, uh, but they were geometric. And he, he built fantastical creations as a child with these blocks and he never he never really got away from that he used the same geometric blocks when he became an adult and was designing buildings and you can see that really clearly here with uh his his studio here's a detailed view again we'll talk about this more on our walk this is looking at the entrance i'll talk a little bit about how uh, rights entryways work uh, when we do our walk um, uh, a week from today. Here is the floor plan and an elevation uh, from his uh, Vosmuth portfolio that he did in 1909. So here is the entrance right here in the center bottom that goes into an entry hall uh, where he could meet clients and contractors and then the square cubicle space off to the left is the drafting studio. You can see the little drafting tables incorporated in there. And then on the right, he called it the library, this, this octagon shape connected with a little hall here. Um, he called it a library, but it basically was his own private office. This is where he could meet clients. This is where he could um, you know, sit by himself and, and work in peace and quiet to, uh, to sketch up new ideas and stuff. And then he could walk them over to the studio and have his drafts people and architects uh, refine them. You know, Wright took a lot of credit. He he was a he was a, not short on ego, and you know took all the credit for everything he did. He had immensely talented men and women working for him, and they you know it was a collaboration for sure. And some of you will discover that when you're doing your research. 
You had a question, Javon? Yeah, so you said that the, the big square was the studio? Yes, that's this uh, view right here. So did you have a question about that? Um, no, I just um, didn't really hear you when you were um, talking about the square part. Oh, yeah, so this is the studio space. We go back to the plan real quick. On the left, this square in plan is the studio space itself, and that's what this view is. But as we saw on the exterior, at the top part was an octagon drum on top, and so we're seeing that up here in the balcony. We see the octagon on top. So he's taking two geometric shapes, and he's uh, connecting them together in a really creative way. And so on the ground floor, you can see the drafting tables. Uh, and there's reproductions of them still in, if you take a tour, uh, that's, this is where the, the architects and the designers sat and worked. And then the, the balcony up here in the octagon drum, uh, he would have visiting artists um, uh, incorporated art a lot into his prairie school buildings. And so they could work up in the a little studio in the balcony space. And you can see that it's completely vaulted. And notice the chains. Uh, the chains are original. And they are, they're the ch kinds of chains that you need whenever you have an open vaulted space like this. Um, you, you know, just like Brunelleschi at the uh, Duomo in, in Florence, he had essentially a, a chain that helped to create a, a tension link to hold the dome together. Uh, the same principle applies, except that right exposes the structure here uh, and makes it a decorative feature, not just a structural feature. And you can see the vertical chains hang down. They hold up the ends of the balcony. And in the next photo, you can see it more clearly. Uh, the chains carry down from that and are holding the light fixtures. So he's taking a, a structural element. He's expressing that. That's part of that form follows function that Sullivan put into words. And he's creating another function for it uh, to hold up the balcony and yet another function for it to hold up the, the lights. Uh, so uh, it's a really great example of how innovative and creative he was. Also notice fireplace you know normally you don't have a fireplace in your office uh, and some of the architects talked about how even in the middle of July Wright would have a roaring fire going uh, because he felt it symbolically was necessary meanwhile they were burning up in there <laughs> it would be it's so hot but Wright was working in his private office off on the other side so he didn't care all right, so let's talk about a couple of um, early uh, prairie style houses. Um, the, the, one of the most important early ones is the Ward Willits House. This is on the North Shore in Highland from 1902. And here's another great example of a photo I took in the spring with the crocus blooming uh, that helps show, you know, the building in its natural setting here. Um, and it's easier to photograph these buildings before the leaves come in because then it really covers it up and you can't see anything. Uh, so this is um, stucco clad. We see the elements of the Prairie School that we talked about. It has a low hipped roof, right? Uh, really deep overhanging eaves. You can see an emphasis on horizontal lines, especially with this sort of belt course right here and even the water table at the ground. Um, and here's a central massive chimney. Doesn't have lots of little chimneys like we were seeing earlier in England. Uh, there's bands of windows. Some of them are in shadow under the eaves, so it's hard to see. But there's a band of windows here and here. There's also more on this wing that stretches out along here. Um, and it spreads out over the landscape. We'll see that in the plan, especially in a moment. Here's a nice detailed view of the main living room wing, and you can see that art class a little better. This has some of the most incredible art class, um, and it's really valuable now. Um, some, of, some of his houses, the, the art glass windows have been removed over the different decades and uh, would get sold on the auction market. They were really hot in the 80s and 90s going for immense sums of money, and people were worried that homeowners who still had their original windows might, you know, harvest them out of the house and sell them on the auction market to, to make money. But fortunately, that didn't happen too often. 
here's a floor plan. It's a little fuzzy here, um, unfortunately. Here's a, here's a rendering of it. Um, and then the floor plan, this is the main floor here on the left. You can see that it spreads out over the landscape. This is not a rectangular box, and you fit everything into that box. Right allows it naturally and organically. He allows the house to spread out across the landscape. This is similar to what we were seeing in the earlier English examples with Red House and with Macintosh and Boise. Um, and so he, he's definitely influenced by that idea. Um, and, and again, he's very much inspired by nature and organic architecture, which he learned from Louis Sullivan, who was also, we saw his organic nature-inspired ornament. Uh, we actually call these pinwheel plans um, because it has a central core or hub, which is the fireplace right here in the center, and then the wings of the house come out like fan blades that you would see on a pinwheel. And so um, scholars usually refer to these floor plans as pinwheel designs. Another really important early design is the Susan Dana house. This is in Sfield, Illinois from 1902. And I lived in Springfield for three years, and I can tell you this is about the best thing in Springfield. <laughs> uh, but it is really cool. So if you go to Springfield, make sure you visit. This is a state historic site. You can take a tour in normal times. Um, do it. Um, there's the Lincoln sites. That's great too, of course. But And you can go to visit the Capitol, whatever. But <laughs> the highlight to me is the, the Susan Dana house. Um, here is a, a view of it. Um, you can see, again, elements of the prairie school or style. We see a lot of emphasis on horizontal lines. We see the bands or ribbons of windows. Uh, it's low slung. Um, this does not, however, have hipped roofs. It has low slung gable roofs. Here you can see it a little better. Um, a little bit of a variation here. Um, and I'll, sh I'll kind of tie this in a little bit in a moment. Notice how the hip or how the roof gable, it's low and then it sort of flares out here at the, at the ends. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, notice the, also the entryway. It has a Roman arched entrance. Again, this ties back to H.H. H. Richardson and his work, um, especially in Chicago with the, um, with the Marshall Field Warehouse and with the Glessner House, right, would have been familiar with both of those. And so, or, yeah, uh, Louis Sullivan was influenced and much of his work featured these Roman arches. And so many of Wright's early prairie designs featured Roman arches, especially entrances and fireplaces. There's a, also a little bit of verticality here. This is, like I said, slightly different variation on the Prairie School. These, these front windows emphasize a certain amount of verticality, which is unusual in Wright's later works, later Prairie works. Um, and here's another view, one of the wings. This also has a kind of pinwheel design, so all these different wings are extending across the landscape here. But one of the things he does, and this is one of my favorite elements of the house, is the second floor has this plaster frieze. Uh, that's just a geometric ornament, uh, doesn't necessarily mean anything, and it's uh, painted or colored to be kind of bronze looking, almost like uh, he was influenced by the bronze or the cast iron painting to look like bronze uh, that Sullivan did at, at uh, the Schlesinger and Mayer store on State Street. Um, this it really is beautiful. It's, it's, it's a crafted element. You know, we can see true arts and crafts elements right here on the exterior of the house. This is part of what makes it an arts and crafts, you know, style of architecture here. Um, ironically, this would have been made in a factory mold. Uh, Wright wasn't obsessed with handcrafted artistry. Uh, he wanted the beauty of artistry, but if that could be done by a machine, he was okay with that. So we're seeing an evolution really breaking away from the origins of the arts and crafts movement to being more of an aesthetic uh, movement, right? They want the looks of the arts and crafts, but not necessarily the obsession with the everything being handcrafted. And that helped to make things more affordable, just like we talked with Stickley Furniture, the manufacturers that wind up making it in a factory, ordinary people could buy it. Mrs. Dana was a very wealthy client, but he had other clients that were nowhere near as uh, 
wealthy as Mrs. Dana, and they were more likely to afford factory made elements and or and ornamentation. So uh, there's there's definitely a mix in Wright's work here. Here is, this is the back view uh, from the garden. And um, this was right around the corner from where I lived. I lived about two blocks from the, from the Dana house uh, when I lived in Springfield. And one of my favorite things was to do, was to come and just sit in this courtyard and look at this view. Um, so I had to throw this in here. But you can see, look how much area of wall surface he devotes to windows. Um, we're gonna, that's a theme we're gonna see more and more as we get into modern architecture, more and more glass, more and more windows um, till we get to the point where buildings are all glass, right? So his influence is, is really Japanese, um, less medieval, less English. Uh, he was inspired by Japanese architecture. And this is a, a historic view of the Japanese pavilion known as the Ho'oden uh, at the Columbian Exposition of 1893. We haven't talked about the Columbian Exposition yet. We will. Um, most of it's the Beaux-Arts architecture. The Japanese pavilion uh, was created in traditional Japanese uh, design. If you were in my class in the fall, you probably remember looking at stuff like this. And I think I even told you then that we would be talking about Japanese architecture again in the spring semester when I talked about Frank Lloyd Wright. So, you know, look at the roofs, look how low slung they are and look how they flare out at the ends. Uh, really, Wright is really mimicking those roof lines with the Dana house. And even the fact that, right, that he has this sort of upper, story that is recessed and is a different material, you can see that done in traditional Japanese architecture as well. Um, there's, he doesn't copy, you know, this is it's about as, Dana House is about as close as he would copy Japanese architecture. Um, he's influenced by it. And that's what part of what makes Wright so great is that he, he takes something else and he absorbs it and he you know, reveals it, you know, out of his hand, out of his idea, you know, onto a piece of paper and ultimately into a building as something completely different. You can still see the origins of it, but it is nowhere near a copy. And that's what makes him a great designer. And he was, you know, not just the exterior forms. This is a view I showed you. This is from the Japanese Imperial Villa in Kyoto um, from the 1600s, right? Um, he would have been familiar with this type of architecture through you know, monographs and prints and so forth. He would eventually first visit Japan in 1905, but he was already obsessed with Japanese architecture and planning. And, you know, when we talked about Japanese architecture, we talked about the Soji screens, right? Those movable panels that we see here um, that allow flexibility between rooms. The Japanese didn't cr just create four plaster walls to create space. They had a meandering openness in their interior planning and Wright translates that to his own floor plans uh, in his own homes. And then the Soji screens are like panels with translucent light and also the vistas and the connections. The Japanese have an obsession with connecting to nature and we see the same principles with Frank Lloyd Wright. He wants to connect his families living in his homes to the natural landscape outside. So a few interior examples of the Dana house. This is uh, one of the main living rooms. And we see, like we did with the playroom in his own home and studio, a barrel vault. Uh, we can see the bands of windows that allow lots of light in. Uh, we see his own furniture designs. Um, the Dana house is amazing because all furniture is intact. When Mrs. Dana died and the house was sold off, I think that was in the 1940s, nobody cared about Frank Lloyd Wright in these houses at that time, but a family, the Thomas family, bought it and used it as their own um, uh, law office, and they kept all the furniture. Uh, I guess he, he was one of the few people who thought this was pretty cool stuff, and so we kept it all, and when the Thomas family you know, died or sold it off, the, the state bought it in the early 80s and said, oh my God, this is a completely intact Frank Lloyd Wright house. Really, really rare. 
and uh, with all of its furniture, all of its windows, its R class fixtures, and so it's now a state historic site for that reason. Here is another little um, little ingle nook, so to speak. You can see some of the incredible art glass that he has in here. And this is a part of the way that Wright connects the family with nature. You know, the natural world is outside. He reinterprets that through an abstraction in the art class. You know, his he believes in this geometric. He does not introduce sort of the naturalist organic art, uh, ornamentation the way Louis Sullivan did, he, he abstracts it into a geometric form. But it's like he's reinterpreting the nature, natural world outside for the family on the inside. And it's, it's kind of this middle step. And then you've got the interior and you see his own um, architectural designs on the interior. Here's a view of the entry hall. You can just make out a little bit of the archway of the entrance down here on the lower left. Um, he does not believe in having people just walk into a space. He, Wright, believes that you should experience architecture three-dimensionally. And that means moving around it. We'll talk about that when we're talking about on our walking tour, we talk about the exteriors. Uh, but here on the inside, you can see you don't just walk in into the room. You you come in, you have to go up a little flare, flight of stairs off behind that pier, and you come in over here uh, towards the back of the image before you can walk into the main space where the photographer is. Um, that moves you around the space. It, he's, you're moving it, you're going up. You're at a ground level here and then you rise up a flight of stairs. And then you see that there's another level up above you there. Everything is three-dimensional around you. You're, a, you're, you're completely immersed in a, in a volume of space. You're not just, and you can't fully make out where it begins and where it ends. Wright loved to do that, and later modernist architects were really obsessed with Wright's planning more than his decorative arts. Here's a view of the dining room, really exquisite. You can see more of his art glass. You can see glass, light dining room, light fixtures here. Uh, on the upper wall is an incredible mural that was uh, commissioned for the space that was still intact. And you can see it again in the historic view. There's the light fixtures, there's the furniture, and there's that mural. Also had a barrel vaulted space. He later got rid of the barrel vaults as his prairie style matured. Um, so these are, these are early examples where you see that influence by Sullivan. And lastly, uh, a detail of the art glass windows. These are based on a sumac plant uh, that are, was common in the prairie and he abstracts that geometrically so that even when you're only looking at you know a courtyard right you have a, a a sort of a view an interpretation of the natural view outside your window there all right a couple of the other examples i'm going to breeze through just so you can see the images uh, because we can talk more about them on our walking tour next week the arthur hurtley house in oak park from 1902 Here's an exterior view of that. It's one of my favorite houses, actually. Uh, but it, you can see it has the elements of the prairie style, the roof, the chimney, the horizontal lines. We'll talk more about, <clears throat> we'll talk more about that next week. I love this view. I took this photograph during a, a house walk that I helped to organize, and it, it, we incorporated antique cars. Uh, the car dates after the house. You know, this is a 1930s car, uh, but I thought it was a really cool ju juxtaposition there. But I do want to show you this interior photo because we won't see the inside, of course. Uh, this is the main living room, and once again, we see a barrel vaulted or barrel arched fireplace, um, but you know, the, the roof form is expressed in the ceiling. It's a vaulted ceiling. Uh, it's not just a flat ceiling in here. He's got art glass skylights. He's got the furniture. This is reproduction that the family put in um, of the original furniture that he designed for the house. You can see there's a built-in. Uh, built-ins were really common in arts and crafts. And then, you know, it has a Japanese feel. You can see the different elements. These wall panels are almost like soji screens. Another example we'll be able to see on our walking tour, of course, is Unity Temple, one of his masterpieces. Uh, this dates from 1906 and finished in 1908. Here's a rendering view of it. And 
go, this definitely will go back to that geometry, that obsession with geometry that we talked about. Um, you can see how the two geometric forms with a connector link that serves as the main entrance. Here's a more current view. It's just been beautifully restored. This is another one. Hopefully you all have had an opportunity to go inside Unity Temple. You can take a tour. Um, you can pay, you know, your 20 bucks or whatever uh, to take a tour. Or you could, you know, for free, you could go to a Sunday service, right? <laughs> if you can sit through that for, for an hour, you can see, you know, you can really see the space. Um, uh, so I urge you to do at least one of those or go to a wedding reception or something there too. Uh, it's a, if you're invited, not, I'm not encouraging you to crash weddings. What's unique about Unity Temple is it's a cast concrete building, one of the very first cast concrete buildings in America. Uh, so he's innovative with his materials. Um, here's a nice view of the exterior, a couple of details on the exterior. Again, we'll, we can talk and see more of this on our walk. I do want to show you the plan. Similar to the plan I showed you of his studio, right? He's got this large square space on the left. He's got a little different geometry on the right, and then he's connecting it with this uh, wing or little channel that actually serves as the entrance hall. Uh, the, the one on the left is the main sanctuary space, and then the, the space on the right is the um, the kind of fellowship hall, right? After services, you can have tea or coffee and snacks in here. And after a wedding, you can have a reception or party in here and that sort of thing. Sunday school classes are in here and that sort. Um, but in the in the space, he, let me show you the section here. Uh, he has windows only up at the top, clear story windows. If we go back to earlier last semester when we talked about clear story windows in churches. Uh, so that when you're in this when you're in the sanctuary, you're not distracted by views of the world outside. You see light coming in from above, which has a certain symbolism, you know, spiritual symbolism, uh, both from the skylights and from these clear story windows. But you're not distracted by what's going on in the world outside. You're focused on the minister or whoever is giving the sermon uh, so that you're listening and you're paying attention. Uh, he forces you to do that by the design of his space. So here's a great view that I took from the balcony looking down at the, the pulpit. And you can see there's wonderful light coming in on these clear story windows up at the top. And they're beautiful art class windows, but you're not so distracted by them, or at least you're not distracted by what's outside of them. You're focused on what's happening on the inside of the space. Here's a detail. All of the interior plaster work was, was restored back to its original colorings um, in the restoration that my former boss did uh, just a few years ago. And all of this is concrete form with a plaster finish on it. And here is uh, the skylight. Really great skylight in here. I'll finish up here real quick. I know we're running over real, real, just a little bit. Uh, another example we'll see on our walking tour is the Mrs. Gale house uh, from Oak Park 99. Uh, she was a widow uh, who um, had actually, she and her husband had um, worked with Wright previously. And then when she, her husband died, she had Wright designed this relatively small house for her uh, just off of uh, Forest Avenue. And this is a little bit different also in the Prairie style. We'll talk about how it's different later um, when we're doing our walk. And last is the Roby House. This is from 1909. This is in Chicago down in Hyde Park neighborhood and is considered by most scholars to be his piece de resistance of the Prairie School era here. This is a good historic view. Um, ironically, this is not set in the wide open prairie. This is in a city lot in the south side of Chicago, um, but um, he makes full advantage of the lot really spreading out across the entire lot everything in this house is horizontal um, and emphasizes the horizontality of the architecture. There's a couple of contemporary views. Uh, the massing is complex, right? The, the, he's not just doing simple boxes and rectangles. He's creating different forms and different lines and, and views to, em but all of them emphasize the horizontality of of, of the site and of you know the eaves and the brick lines and the water tables, the stone belt courses, and the ribbon or banded windows of art class all emphasize the horizontality with one central massive chimney that is meant to anchor it all to the site visually.
here's another great view to that emphasizes that horizontality. And in plan, uh, here's a great way to show you what I was talking about with the sort of open plan, how spaces flow from one to another. If we look at the main living level, uh, there's a central core of a fireplace because he thought the hearth was the heart of the home and should be at the center. And on one side's the living room, the other side's the dining room. There's no doorway leading from one to another. You don't walk through a hallway to get from one to another. They're one, it's one space. But they're divided by this uh, by this chimney mass and stair in the middle. Same thing happens also down below in the billiard and children's room. And so if we look at that from the interior standpoint, um, this great vista from the living room, we're, we see that chimney mass uh, and it blocks our view of the dining room. So therefore it visually separates it, but it's still one space. There's no doorway over here on the left or right. You just walk around the chimney and flow into the dining room space. You flow from one space to another. It's this natural progression. It is not a forced uh, feature like a doorway or a hallway that you have to walk down to go into another doorway into another space. Uh, it's all flowing space. Um, and so if you're in one room, you can sort of almost talk to someone in another room. This is the view of the dining room, uh, again, with some of his original furniture designed for the space. And, uh, oh, there's a historic view of the dining room and a view looking back from the dining room towards the living room. So again, you see that it's all connected. Uh, there's, there's no physical separation between rooms. And this is what Wright was trying to accomplish here. All right, we're going to cut off there. Um, and we'll talk more about Frank Lloyd Wright uh, Thursday, next Thursday, when we do our walking tour. And we'll finish up Arts and Crafts with the Green Brothers in California next time.